Good to see you all here. I'm Ralph Hexter, the Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth event in the 2018-19 season of the UC Davis Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. The UC Davis Forums was founded in 2012 and presents about a half dozen lectures each academic year by experts from a range of disciplines. The series was designed to promote informed and thoughtful dialogue among members of the campus community and the public on the following subjects. The major challenges facing the public university, ways of responding to those challenges, and how the public university is evolving. With an ultimate goal, of producing a public university that will best serve society and individuals, this series poses the following question. What should and can the public university be in the 21st century? In our preceding six seasons, the UC Davis Forums has presented distinguished speakers on a wide range of topics pertaining to the public, and I should say all universities, and the social good, including educational access and affordability, diminishing public confidence in the institutions of higher education, and equity and diversity in the academy, among many others. I uh, urge you to visit this series website, uh, excuse me, forums.ucdavis.edu, to find information about all of this season's events as well as videos of past events. For today's forum, we're delighted to welcome Charles Klotfelter, the Z. Smith Reynolds Professor of Public Policy policy and professor of economics at Duke University. He will speak on the topic, the growing inequality of colleges, how and why. As a quick review of past titles shows, this series has returned again and again to the topic of inequality in higher education. Our speakers have addressed the problem under a variety of interrelated and overlapping headings including educational access and opportunity, the measurement and promotion of equity and diversity on campuses, how medical schools can produce doctors dedicated to addressing regional health disparities, the impacts of sexism and racism, and the relationship between earning a degree and economic and social mobility, an area that Professor Klotfelder will explore. Our continued attention to inequality as it pertains to higher education reflects an urgent concern and with the topic across the academy and society, as well as a very great deal of analytical and perspective attention dedicated to it. I suspect that some of you may have had the same conflicted reaction to the presentation abstract printed on the, f the event flyer. Thankful that such an eminently qualified researcher would be addressing this important topic, but perhaps a little deflated, those of us who have the privilege of holding an administrative or faculty position at a college or university generally take pride in how much our institutions do to foster equal opportunity, treatment, and rewards for our students as applicants seeking admissions, as enrolled students, and as graduates pursuing a career and other life goals. Our investment of effort and resources toward this end are very considerable. But despite all that is being done, there's wide agreement that our degree of success has thus far fallen far short of our hopes. This realization is sobering enough, but Professor Klotfelter promises to add even more clouds to our sky. He will discuss how our colleges and universities do not merely continue to accommodate inequality, but actually may, and here I quote, contribute to more inequality. To be sure, this is a gloomy message, but it's also a sunny one in the sense that it helps us to see where our future efforts must be directed. Professor Klotfelder will get a proper introduction shortly, introduction shortly, but before that, I have a few thank yous and announcements. I'd like to thank all who've made this event possible. First and foremost, Professor Klotfelder for joining us today to share his research and insights both cloudy and sunny. Next, the UC Davis Forum Steering Committee, led by Martin K Kenny, Professor of Human and Community Development, and our moderator for this event, Professor Scott Carroll of Economics. And finally, I want to thank the two campus units that have joined my offer, office to sponsor this event, the Community and Regional Development Program and the Center for Regional Change. One more announcement. After today's presentation, there'll be a question and answer period and then a reception right here. We hope that you can stay for talk and refreshments. And now, Professor Carroll.
Thank you, Ralph. Um, it's my uh, distinct pleasure today to introduce uh, Charles T. Klotfelder, or Charlie as we all know him. Uh, Charlie is the Z. Smith uh, Reynolds Professor of Public Policy Studies in the Stan Stanford School of Public Policy in the Department of Economics at Duke University. He directs the Duke's Center for the Study of Philanthropy and Volunteerism and is an affiliate of the Duke Center for Child and Family Policy and a faculty research scholar of Duke's Population Research Center. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research where he previously headed the Higher Education Working Group and in 2015 was inducted to the prestigious National Academy of Education. <clears throat> Charlie has a long and distinguished career as an economist who primarily studies education policy. He has written 70 journal articles, 25 book chapters, and authored seven books, including Big Time Sports in American Universities, as well as today's topic, uh, uh, lecture Unequal Colleges in the Age of Disparity, uh, published by Harvard University Press in 2017. His book examines the rising inequality in higher education over the past four decades using the basic economic tools of supply, demand, and markets. The topic of his lecture today could not be more relevant given today's, this week's sad news of admission scandals at elite colleges and universities. To illustrate, the introduction of Charlie's book states, another source of growing inequality among colleges is competition on the demand side for the limited spots at the most selective colleges. Affluent families use a variety of approaches to secure an advantage for their children in the fierce tournament for admission. How prophetic was that? Finally, in addition to his career as an education scholar, Charlie is well known for his collegial personality, a somewhat rarity among economists, as well as his longtime mentor to many junior economists. Uh, one of which is myself, who was a benefactor to him when he headed the Higher Education Working Group and gave me the opportunity to present my work as a uh, brand new postdoctorate at the NBR uh, Higher Education Seminars. So it is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Charlie Klotfelter. Thank you, Charles. I've been instructed to turn this on. How's that? Scott and, and Professor Hexter, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I just noticed I, I have one advantage that I didn't uh, anticipate, that I am going to be talking uh, with the protection of Hello Kitty in front of me. If you're close enough, you see this, uh, and it's been, a, uh, it's been a source of chagrin to my family that I like this little uh, uh, picture so much uh, without, you know, even a daughter to, uh, to have an excuse to, to have it, so. Um, but uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, is, is a little gloomy, and, uh, and I hope that there will be a, a little brightness, but you know, I can't really promise too much. Um, as, uh, here's the question that motivated the, the work that's, uh, uh, that I'll be talking about. We know that the income inequality in the U.S. has uh, gone up. What I wanted to know is what's the role of colleges? Uh, I'm going to use the word college today to mean colleges and universities, and I'll be only talking about four-year uh, colleges and universities, not uh, community colleges as important as they are, and I won't be talking about the for-profit um, sector as well. Traditionally, we've looked at colleges as an engine of opportunity, enabling young people to uh, aspire to levels of, of power and, uh, and affluence undreamed by their parents in some cases. But we read more and more about uh, the possibility that rather than making things more equal, that colleges are making things more unequal. So that's really what I was going to look at. Now here. I'm going to depart very quickly and note this, this sensational news um, story that we've only known about for 48 hours. Uh, it has a um, eerily uh, uh, close connection to some of the points I'll be making. And at one point in my talk, I, I promised to use the words that I was originally going to use, but I will note that 
I am saying what I said originally, and, and I don't mean to be ironic. Uh, but what we see is, uh, in these stories is uh, gross. It's a perversion of, of some, in, in some cases, quite um, understandable motives. Uh, but things have gone way too far. But you'll see that there might be a continuum where it might be a little hard to know where should we draw the line. So, beginning somewhere uh, during the 1970s, the incomes of people at the top rungs of, uh, of our income distribution started uh, going up. And the red uh, dots here show the percentage of total U.S. income that are collected by 1% of all households. And that number was, uh, in 1976, they got about 10% of total income. By 2014, their share had doubled to 20%. Meanwhile, the income of the entire bottom half of the income distribution, which had been uh, 20%, fell to 13%. So, by 2014, the top 1% of households collected about one and a half times the total amount of income the, of the entire bottom half of the income distribution. Now, in the face of that change, I wanted to know what, roles, what role did colleges play I have to say, I soon realized that was not going to be a question I could answer. Um, in part because of data, but mostly in part because it's a very complicated question to ask. Let me give you an example. There is a cardiologist in Durham, North Carolina, who is associated with the Duke Medical School, and he is a graduate of this fine institution, UC Davis. That's where he got his undergraduate degree. To what extent do I attribute his increased productivity over his years of living to UC Davis, uh, as opposed to the skills and traits he got up, he got when he was in, um, uh, before, when he was in high school, or his residency or medical training. To attribute uh, these increases in productivity, which he certainly did experience, it's very difficult to know how to give uh, credit to uh, UC Davis, though I'm sure it was important. Uh, so, but it is important, I think, to uh, ask a question about long-term trends, and that's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is uh, what I think will be helpful circumstantial evidence that's going to be relevant to the question I ask. So here's the question that I judged was within uh, my reach. Did colleges become more or less equal over the roughly 40-year period between 1970 and 2010? So did they get more unequal? And my study became an attempt to answer the question using as many metrics as I could. Um, I adopted a three-pronged approach. Uh, throughout, and I'll just say right now, this is a descriptive study, I'm not going to do what many of my colleagues are able to do often, and that is to establish causality. I'm going to describe some changes. Uh, the first thing I did was to look at all four-year colleges, not just a few of the uh, prime sources, the prestigious Eastern, the private institutions, plus Stanford, and the flagship uh, publics. No, I wanted to look at all of the four-year uh, colleges. And I've been guilty of that kind of uh, disproportionate attention as well. So I included in my sample all of the nearly 1,200 four-year institutions that existed as four-year institutions way back in 1970. And I assigned them into categories, and I'll tell you why the categories are important in a second, on three criteria, whether they're public or private, okay, that's one change, whether uh, they were historically black uh, institution, HBCU, I put them off in one side because of their historical importance, and then the other was by the SAT quartile or, well, decile or even percentile they were in 1970. So I grouped them 
according to their SAT level of their students in 1970. Once they're in a category, they, they stayed in that category. Um, putting in these, and I'll, let me say a word about the method here. Putting the colleges into categories not only made things a little simpler, it was required because the data I use, a lot of it comes from something called the freshman surveys, something that's done by UCLA in, since the late 60s, and they said, we'll tell you for each individual uh, data uh, observation, we'll tell you what category the student came from, but we won't tell you his or her college. And we'll tell you the category as long as the category has at least five colleges. So you'll see that I've got to uh, configure the colleges that uh, have data into categories that are at least five uh, large. The second thing I did was to take um, an expansive or agnostic view of what information I wanted. So not only did, was I interested in things like uh, income, but I also wanted to think, look like things like um, racial diversity, um, religious preferences, political leanings. I wanted to look at uh, other measures of SES. There's also measures of grades in high school and things like um, time use. Um, so I was open for, for business. Uh, because I thought that part of the story that I told in this, this study was not only inequality, because I hadn't judged it that it was going to get worse, that was something that came later, but I wanted to reflect on the diversity of the, of the different colleges. So here I developed a new appreciation for the apocryphal man who's looking for his keys uh, under a lamp, lamp post, and somebody says, hey, did you lose your keys under the lamp post? Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, we're over there somewhere in the dark, but this is where the light is good. And so I you know, basically said, I, I want to see what can I measure, and, and I measure it in a consistent way. And the third approach thing, part of my approach, was to take a long view. So think of me as a little kind of uh, unofficial economic historian. Uh, and I wanted to look at the period starting with uh, 1970, before this grand change in income distribution happened, and pretty much as late as I could, and, and as late as I could back when I was working to get these data was about uh, 2010. So think of it, the 40 years between 1970 and uh, 2010. Um, now, how to use this freshman survey. Uh, not all the data came from this freshman survey, but a lot of it did. And what I wanted to, I wanted to have colleges where, that I could observe in, in around 1970, and then again around 1990, and then again around 2010. So the college, every college had to participate at three points in time. Eventually, I came to require they had to uh, participate in the year 1972, and then again in 1989 or 1990, when the questions were the same, and then again in, 19, in 20. Uh, 08, 0, 09. So those are the three things. So when I say uh, 1970, sometimes I'm going to really mean 1972, but I'll usually say 2009, or sometimes the data are a little bit more uh, recent than that. Given my three criteria and that requirement, I was able to find, and I was in, in, uh, impressed at, at the number, 188 different colleges participated in the freshman survey in 1972, 1989 or 1990, and uh, 2009. So I'm able to compare colleges by looking at the students in those colleges, and in each case, it's exactly the same colleges I'm comparing. So when you look at a comparison, it, when I'm going to give it to you, it's not because, well, a few colleges dropped out and a few came in, and so that explains why the difference. It's exactly the same colleges. And to me, uh, as, a, as a, again, an unofficial historian, I think that's uh, uh, pretty impressive. And so here's, I give you the 17 uh, units here. And I, and I also, uh, yeah, I think you can still hear me. So I'm going to introduce a technology that hasn't been used here in this room in a long time. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And, and so we have these, these, these are the 17 uh, groups here. There's 
Uh, the two HBCUs, which I won't really talk about much today, there are four groups of uh, public and 11 of private. And you say, well, how come there are so many more privates than public? It's because a lot more um, private institutions participated. So I could, I could fine tune, I could really slice and dice these, these private ones. But down here, we had to have five each. And the, uh, for, for this audience, the uh, group of most interest is the 80 to 90 uh, percentile public. That's where UC Davis is. UC Davis was not one of the five institutions that participated, but uh, the five were the University of Iowa, uh, it was the University of North Carolina, it was um, UC Santa Barbara, SUNY Potsdam, and uh, UMass Amherst. And that produced about 12,000 observations for each of the three points. So there's a lot of observations when, on these things, but what I'm going to basically do is give you means with the idea that the standard deviations really aren't that big. Now, to be sure, the data on things like family income are not as good in this survey as they are for this work that's done by Raj Chetty and uh, Emmanuel Saez and others who use uh, incredible data based on um, income tax returns. But unlike theirs, I can show you data over a very long period. And basically what I wanted to do is to say, wait, do we have information that would suggest that schools, that colleges are getting more unequal over time? So my theme is inequality, so let me get to that. Um, I need to make one thing very clear from the start. This industry never was equal. So that's really what we have to begin with. And, and to put a little bit of meat on that assertion, let me show you one aspect in which colleges in 1970 were not equal. This is something we don't talk about in public or, or in private uh, conversation because we don't hurt people's feelings. But one way that uh, colleges were different was that their grades were, were, the grades of students were very different. And I, for each of the sections here, you have a distribution. And you can see that for the, um, for the group I want you to pay most attention to, the public 80 to 90, in, in that group, and, which I expect to be representative of UC Davis also, that about, um, 10% said they made an A or A plus average in high school. Uh, by comparison, the, the lowest SAT group of publics, which is down here, about 5, uh, 6% right here. And then at the most selective private institutions, uh, the percent who said they made A or A plus was 38%. So a tremendous difference in the grades that these young people brought to college. Uh, likewise, there was inequality in, in several measures of socioeconomic status, but here's their estimated income of, of the uh, families in those different categories. And what you see is that there, there is a gradation that starts uh, at the bottom and goes up. So you can see that the income of families was quite correlated to the um, SAT level of the students in 1972. And there were also differences in things like expenditures on professors. Here's the average uh, salary uh, given to full professors in 1970. And you can see just between the last three bars, you see they go up, up, up. Those are the three bars of the public institutions. Between the bottom and the top one, a difference of 37%. So the colleges in, in that year were not equal. Um, they weren't equal in resources. They weren't equal in the preparation of the students. And they certainly weren't equal in, in prestige. Now, let's go forward from 1970 and consider what happened in the next four decades. 
the college market became much more than it had previously been a national market. Now, this is a point that uh, one of the former speakers, Caroline Hoxby, made uh, in, in published research. Uh, it used to be the case that some of the best students would stay within their state, uh, I'm sorry, within their state or within their region. But increasingly, the best students were looking around the whole country because it was cheaper to get from one end of the country to the other, it was cheaper to make phone calls, and it just uh, was easier to consider colleges far away. And the colleges, for their part, also were looking to get the best students from all over the place. So Duke stopped just looking only in the east. Uh, they started trying to go to uh, Texas and even to the faraway state of California to get um, students. And this happened especially for the highest scoring students. Around 19, in, in 1983, a wild card entered the whole mix. Uh, a venerable old weekly news magazine, we used to have three of them, named US News and World Report, decided it would try to make a little extra money by publishing a little section, uh, say, this is gonna be a ranking of American colleges, just a few pages, and it was successful beyond their wildest dreams and it caught the imagination of the American public, and it soon became, after uh, it was repeated in 1985, then it started happening every year, and then it took over while the magazine itself folded, uh, it became, uh, it greased the wheels of competition, in, and this is competition not only between colleges, but between the individuals wanting to get into colleges. There's our theme that we're going to have to come back to. Um, one indication of this geographical expansion of the market was that the best students were more likely to go uh, farther away to college. Uh, one of the graphs which I'm mercifully uh, shielding you from, because I could give you more bar graphs than I will give you, but uh, the percent of colleges that uh, went, of, of of colleges that had students that went more than 500 miles to get to college kept going up and up on, among the most selective private institutions. It didn't budge anywhere else. Um, as a result of this more intense national competition for top students, the most selective colleges began to collect a bigger share of the high performing students. So this is like this is piece of evidence, number one, that things are getting more unequal. Well, maybe, the, maybe the 500 miles was too. The big difference in GPAs that we just saw for 1972, they got bigger. So I'm going to, the next graph I'm going to show you is going to be uh, um, about scholastic shorting, sorting. And what I'm going to do here is, is I'm, all the bars now are going to be corrected for the national average. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, either the students in this country got smarter or something else happened because their average grade in high school really went up. Uh, and, and let's see what it was. The percentage of students, and this is nationally weighted, all college students in those uh, four-year colleges, the percent who made A or A plus in 1972 was 10%. In, in 1990, 14 percent, and in 2009, 25 percent. So there was tremendous uh, grade inflation. So to, do, to correct for that, what I'll show you is deviations from uh, that mean. And what you're going to see is that in the most selective private institutions, they are just going off like rockets. So here what we see is uh, for all three uh, years. So I've got the, th the three points in time, which are called three waves, 1972, again 1990, and then 2009. You can see that the, the blue bars show the deviation in uh, average grades uh, between each category and the national average. And you can see that for the public group that uh, Davis is part of, it stayed ab above, but not, um, uh, not tremendously. 
above uh, the national average. So not only were the most selective colleges getting a bigger share of the A and A plus students, and here's one of the things that really surprised me. Not only were they getting more of the A and A plus students, these, they were getting a bigger share of the studious students, the ones that said in high school, I spent a lot of time uh, studying. So, so for the two of the, of the three years of, of my of my three um, signposts over time, for two of those, there was data uh, on time use. How many hours did you spend, on average, in high school studying? And what, you, uh, what I will tell you is that for the nation as a whole, they re the students reported studying less, going down from about 6.1 hours down to 5.6. But for the very most competitive private institutions, they went up. So not only are they getting uh, these selective colleges getting a higher percentage of the A and A plus students, they're getting a higher percentage of the wonks. Uh, or uh, at least if we are to believe these thousands of people that are answering these, these questions, which I believe is, is uh, while they're not necessarily accurate to the point, they're probably not biased either because they're all answering. Um, and I should say, by the way, that one of the great things about the freshman survey is they have a very high response rate because when the students are there only for the first few days of class, they didn't know they had the option of not answering it. So it's a very high, uh, it's a, a very high rate of, uh, of response. Now, not to take anything away from these um, Students, because they were studious students. But, uh, and here's another graph I didn't show you. If you also ask the students uh, in the in typical week, how many hours did you work for pay, the students at these most selective private institutions were much less likely to say they spent a lot of time. In fact, in comparing the 80 to 90 public group, again, that's the Davis group, that they had, a, uh, they reported an average wor working about seven and a half hours a week for pay outside of school. Uh, the, the top most selective private, which is Harvard and Amherst group, they reported about 2.8 hours. So here we see part of this new meritocracy, part of this new merit-driven admissions program, which has an an affluence bias. If you're uh, well off enough that you don't need to work after school, then you have enough time to do the studying. Now you still have to do the studying, but it does give you uh, an opportunity. There's another difference, and that is in, uh, we, they were asked, uh, these fr freshmen were asked, oh, what, what are you planning to major in? And here I'm gonna show uh, the share that are thinking about majoring in a STEM um, major. And you can see that, again, if you look at those top most, private, most selective private institutions, and they are boom, 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 the, the, the proportion of those thinking about uh, majoring in STEM was going up over time. So what it is that they were already unequal but over this time, they're becoming more unequal in, in terms of grades, in terms of how hard they're working, and whether they're, they want to do something um, mathematical. By the way, today is Pi Day 314, so we acknowledge that. Uh, and, and also in, in the Davis group, uh, there's going up. This is the, uh, the Georgia Tech and Stony Brook and other groups, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's high already. Uh, and, and so we see, um, we see signs that uh, are point to the following conclusion, and, and this is what I'll say uh, and then stop this section. <laughs> the serious students were increasingly concentrating in the most selective colleges. So that's, that's the take home point. Now, before we go to economic diversity, because that's what uh, I certainly want to talk about as well, let me say a word about diversity. Uh, 
that was, there were really two, three themes in, in my, my book. One was competition, you'll see that. Uh, one is inequality, we've seen that already. And the other one is uh, uh, diversity. These, not all these colleges were trying to do the same thing. Uh, so let me just uh, show a couple of dimensions of uh, diversity. Diversity characterizes both the colleges and the students. Now, I'm going to give you a slide which you definitely can't read, but just trust me that, and I'll tell you what, what it means. Th these are little uh, tidbits from the mission statements from um, college catalogs. And, and I should say that one of the things I did in the study was to look at college catalogs back in 1970, and then again um, contemporary. And uh, I and some Duke students uh, read through these looking for things, of, you know, what, what's the mission of the university? And you can see here, there's a real contrast in what different colleges and universities uh, say. And, and I, would, I was going about to say that there's probably more diversity uh, in, uh, or more differences in the private institutions because you have uh, religious institutions like the uh, second one, T Tennessee Wesleyan. I mean, they're, their mission is not the same as uh, Davidson Colleges or uh, UC Davis. But then if we look between, uh, among public institutions, we think, well, there's probably less diversity, but I want to note that the bottom institution is a public institution. And, and my favorite uh, sentence uh, about in the um, description of um, the Citadel is, um, I don't know which is my favorite, uh, it instills the conviction that sacrifice is preferable to compromise with principle. And I'm just thinking about the value of, of sacrifice. If I think of, if I ask, you know, 10 of my students, how, how important is it is sacrifice? Anyway, they, they might, uh, but certainly they, that they would not believe that military training teaches the value of methodical and orderly approach to tasks. Now, we have a graduate of a military institution right here. We could ask uh, Scott later. It's, I think it, it has worked very well for him. Uh, but I also found diversity uh, among the students. And let me just give you a couple. Uh, this first one is uh, a rather a striking graph. And it's, again, this is going to be a busy graph. And I should also warn you that I've dropped the HBCUs uh, because they are off the chart uh, in terms of uh, non-white students. What we have is stacked bars in which every kind of student who's not a white Native American is added up. And for each of the categories, you see there's a tremendous increase in these percentages. When you add them all up, this is a very different looking population of college students than used to be the case. Uh, where is the, the least diversity is probably among the least selective public institutions, which are right here. These, this is where the bars are low, but they're also some, well, by the time you get to uh, 2009, these bars are pretty high. But look at this, in, um, for, 19, uh, 90, uh, for the 99 plus, some 45% of undergraduates are in one of these categories, which is not a native uh, white. That's a, a tremendous change in the face of students. And just you know, imagine you're back in 1970 and you visit a, a college, any one of these. It was a different world. So, you know, we now kind of take a lot of these things for granted, but that has been a tremendous change. Uh, well, I'll come back to this amount of change because throughout this change, there has also been a fixity of something else. A second thing, immigration. In uh, 1970, about 5% of Americans uh, were born in some other country. So 5% were, would be counted as immigrants. Today, that number is 13%. So over this period, there's been a rise. It's, it hasn't been smooth, but it has been a rise in immigration. Well, that kind of change has uh, affected uh, the students uh, that go to colleges. And again, we have the advantage of, of, ask, of seeing a question that was asked uh, twice, but not three times. So this question was asked in the, um, in the 1990 uh, 
freshman survey, and then again in um, 2009. The question was, um, was English uh, your uh, language that you uh, used when you were growing up? The percentage that said no, look at that increase. But look where the increases are. They're not in the less selective uh, public or private institutions. The increases are in the more selective. So we're seeing here a, a congruence between uh, foreign born and high achievement. That is going to be a theme that we see a lot in, in terms of looking at uh, economic studies of immigration, for example. The last thing along the lines of diversity, and I'm completely unqualified to talk about the consequences or the meaning of this, but I can't resist it. Uh, one of the questions that the freshman survey asked from the very beginning, they said, um, how would you characterize your political views? And they gave students the same five uh, options all the way at every point in time. So how could I resist uh, showing you the results of a, of a question that was asked exactly the same way to students of exactly the same colleges? So I just can't see how it's not interesting. Um, and I, so I should tell you also, again, I'm going to correct for the national means. You will be interested to know, or maybe you can guess, what is the percentage overall? And, and I focus on people that answered the last two categories. Were you conservative or were you far right? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm going to show you the percentage who said I'm either conservative or far right. Over this period, how did that change? In 1972, you think it's higher or lower than, um, than it is today? Well, it was lower. Uh, this was 1970, so people were protesting out there. Uh, it was 15% in 1972, and 2009, it stayed steady, was 24%. Now, how did these colleges differ from these national means? And here is how they differed. Uh, where you see a bar that goes below, that's a below average number of people, students who are saying they're conservative or far right. But notice that in the uh, most selective private institutions, again, every, every one of these things, you know, it's kind of like uh, stultifying in its uh, uh, monotony. Uh, it's, it's always set up the same way. But you see, in the most selective private institutions, they got further and further below on this. So you could say they got further and further more liberal, and, and so did uh, these, the private HBCUs. The, this group right here, uh, I'll tell you why we should bracket those answers. But here's the Davis group. So it was uh, a little bit more liberal, and it got more liberal compared to everything else. But notice that the, the less selective privates and the less selective publics, they're more conservative. And so there, there was kind of a, a differentiation, I mean, more a separation. That last group, not only did it include Georgia Tech, Stony Brook, and somebody I'm forgetting, it also included the Coast Guard Academy, uh, the Military Academy at West Point, and I think, I should remember this, I think it's the Air Force, but uh, uh, anyway, so there's, there's a military component in there which might explain some differences on politics. Um, but look at this. Um, here's the, the, here are the percentages in in, in, in 2009, the percent who said they're conservative or far right was 13% among the most selective privates, 19% in the Davis group, and 27% in the least selective uh, publics. Okay, back to the inequality theme. I'm doing, I think I'm doing all right on time. I might be a little bit ahead, so. Um, let me talk about some outside forces. There are two big outside forces that sort of came and converged on this college market. And, and then the question is, what happened and how did that uh, contribute to the whole uh, uh, 
whole event. Um, the first one, the most important of these, was the growing income inequality that I already mentioned. Uh, but one of the component, one of the, the results of this income inequality was that if you compared the income of high school graduates and the income of college graduates, that difference got bigger and bigger. So if you were thinking about not going to college, you know, the advice would, you, would, you'd be getting is, no, you better think about that twice because look at the difference in these. And so the difference between these two um, incomes is uh, sometimes called the, the college earnings advantage. And so here is what that looked like over time. It, that actually it went down uh, to, um, it took, it hit bottom about 1979, uh, just about when our friend Richard Freeman was writing The Overeducated American. Uh, and, and it looked like, oh, well, you know, we probably have too many college graduates, so, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. Then it started going way up. And so this gap got bigger and bigger. And, um, and what the implication of this is, and, and here now, I'm now going to uh, highlight uh, the, the current scandal, but I'm going to read the, the next two paragraphs exactly as I had written them originally. And, and I'm, so therefore you know, or I'm telling you, I'm not saying them in, in irony, but this is what I had to say. This growing gap was one reason for a surge in the demand for places in the most selective colleges. Going to college and going to a name brand college took on new importance. Admission to one of them became a fiercely sought after prize. This gave rise to feverish efforts to gain an advantage. Perrin, little did I know how feverish. Uh, the second paragraph, starting often before high school, children of highly educated parents were volunteering, traveling abroad, and working as unpaid summer interns. They signed up for SAT prep courses, often taking the test multiple times. They took AP courses. They enrolled in private schools. Through such preparation, these parents and students armed themselves to compete in the increasingly credential-driven process of college admissions." End of uh, paragraph. So basically what we've just witnessed 48 hours ago is a gross perversion of these, uh, of these efforts. And in q and I'm happy to, to talk about it. I was certainly not prepared. Uh, and and you know, had I been writing this book two years later, you know, I would have to include something about that. Okay, outside forces. The first one, inequality. The second big one, and this is going to be very familiar on this campus, uh, has been the decline in the support from state and local government. As a percentage of state and local expenditures between uh, 1970 and 2015, state and local, education dropped from 40% to 33%. If we only look at state governments and support of higher education, which is uh, more relevant, this cutback has been um, even more extreme. Okay, this, this little line graph uh, takes a little explaining. The, the, long, uh, the two long lines, the red one and the light blue one, uh, show uh, on, on the light blue, it's um, tuition, revenue per FTE student, and here I'm, I'm using graduate and undergraduate uh, because it has to be, it, it, no way to separate those. And the red shows the per FTE uh, income uh, revenue from appropriation. So that's the money that we traditionally associate with supporting public institutions. And that number, that number is sort of, uh, you know, goes up and down a little bit like a roller coaster. But then after about 19, um, around 2000, it starts going down kind of big time. And uh, all the while, tuition is getting more and more important. Now, the two little um, orphan graphs up there, the, the black and the, uh, you know, the kind of uh, olive color, 
Those are just for four-year institutions only. The others are four-year and two-year. And they tell the same story. There's a little bit different crossing point. And, but the point is that, um, that state governments, pressed by the demands of health care and the prison system and also the demands for a, a tax reduction, decided they couldn't keep supporting public institutions in the way that they had traditionally. So those are the two big forces. Now I want to turn to um, the supply side of the market. And right now I'm about three quarters of my time. Maybe I've got another um, something, <laughs> 15 minutes. Uh, and, uh, and so let me say uh, uh, rather uh, quickly then to say that the sources of revenue what happened as a result of these uh, great forces? For the wealthiest colleges, uh, the growing inequality turned out to be a bonanza because uh, one of the main contributions, uh, sources of revenue for private institutions was donations. And so what we see is that donations per student went up as a result of this inequality. So as their professors were decrying inequality, they were making out uh, very well indeed. So there was a surge in donations. And what that led to was um, greater endowments at the very top. Look at the, the size of the difference in, and how much those endowments went up. They were aided by very great um, returns on uh, investment. But here's the number. If you want a picture that sort of pictures um, inequality in a nutshell, look at the assets per student. Uh, the assets uh, per student at the lowest publics, the total assets, this is buildings plus financial, $29,000 up a student. At the Davis Group, uh, some $51,000 per student. And at the Amherst Harvard Group, $1.2 million per student. Okay, what did those Asked, what did those re revenues do? They made room for more uh, ex expenditures. And so one of those is to look at average compensation for faculty. You can see they went up and, and they went up smartly everywhere, but m fastest among the, the public. And let me show you um, a disturbing table prepared by another one of your former speakers, uh, Sarah Turner. This shows the ratio of the average full professor at a public divided by the public, uh, by the uh, private number for each of these years. And in, you see in 1971, the average full professor at public institutions made 95% of what the average full professor at the private institutions. Now they had probably had different distributions of schools and so you, it's hard to know exactly what to make of the 95. But the key is, that that number stayed constant for 10 years and then started stepping down. So by two, uh, 2015, the average uh, full professor at these um, publics making only 76% of what they were, uh, uh, what they would be in the, in the private sector. Uh, I guess more interestingly and maybe more ominously, look at the average expenditure per student on uh, expenditures on education and related things. They were going up in the, in the privates, especially in the most put, um, selective privates, but look on the public side, they were going up just paltry amounts. So that is a second, um, I guess, uh, chink in the, in the armor. Um, another response was what we would call tuition discounting, especially at the least um, selective colleges. They were discounting in order to get more attractive students so they would look better in the US News um, surveys. What that meant was giving breaks to high scoring students who often had enough money to pay. Uh, they didn't need that merit scholarship, but they got it anyway. Uh, one last way that I wanna talk about is, let's see, colors don't come out great. I, 
I, I had this, the, the pleasure of looking at um, college catalogs in 1970 and then again uh, for the current times and, and I compared them in several ways. Uh, one of the things I looked at was whether uh, enrollment was going faster than the uh, faculty size. And in fact, they were in three groups. They, they were uh, in all the low SAT institutions, except for chemistry in uh, the low SAT publics. And they also were in the high SAT uh, publics where Davis is. The only group that was immune from this uh, cutback was the, the selective uh, private institutions. Um, I want to take a word of a second to talk about majors. What I also found is I looked at the majors offered by a group of 50 uh, colleges and universities, and what I found was that the majors at the less selective uh, institutions down here, they were, in my judgment, I, I looked at them and I made a judgment on whether the major was occupational slash professional practical or whether it was more traditional arts and sciences abstract classics, for example. Um, and and it, went, it, it went up, more practical, more practical, more practical. The one exception, the Amherst Harvard group, they're doing more uh, majors that look like um, classics and anthropology. Um, And let me give you some examples of the kinds of majors that these colleges and universities were doing. Everybody except the low SAT privates, their most, the, the most common new major was called computer science. Made sense. And look at the kind of majors. But what really is striking about this is that not only were there these differences in uh, resources, but the kinds of majors that the, were being emphasized changed. And look at the majors down here. Athletic training, sports management, hotel, restaurant. Uh, these are pragmatic uh, majors that would be designed to get somebody a job. But what it also meant was that the gaps between the most selective and the less selective were, were not only in dollars, but it was really in the kind of whether, it, whether the uh, training was prosaic and practical or more traditional. I can't resist, though, showing this. This is a page from the Davis uh, catalog in 1970. So if you like history, this is history. This is my, my compatriots in economics. And you see here that um, <coughs> a couple things to note. Um, you can't read it all that well, I know. Uh, but uh, here's a couple of comparisons. Uh, the size of the faculty back then, 15. Today, it's 39. That's a pretty big increase, but it's less proportional than the undergraduate growth at Davis. So they would, they would be in the uh, growing less fast. Number of courses uh, was 30. Now it's 40. You'll be interested to know. I know there's some economists here, so let's just talk about some of the courses that are, are new now that weren't back in 1970. Neuroeconomics, reinforcement learning and decision making. This is an example of a course that comes in because the purview of economics in the world has changed. So it makes sense to have a new course on neuroeconomics. Also, the theory of games, uh, Econ 122. Energy economics, poverty, inequality, and public policy, 133. Economics of human resources, 151. Economics of Education. There are a couple of courses, though, that have been dropped. Economics 117, the Soviet economy. <laughs> uh, and, and this is another, this is a sad one. Economics 150, trade unions and the labor market. Okay. Um, but there's one feature that I cannot resist noting. And I, I show you this. So now I've got my little box around the description of the beginning micro course. It's the principles of microeconomics. And, and it, that gives the description of the course. And I, I give it to you here. Uh, 26 words long. Um, analysis of the allocation of resources, distribution of income through price system, competition and mon monopoly, the 
uh, the role of public policy in comparative economic systems. Now, let's go back, let's go forward 48 years. What do you think the distribution, what do you think the description looks like today? <laughs> now, I, I present this as, in, in my view, it is exactly what you would want. The, the, the discipline of economics is doing the same thing. This is a perfect description back when there was a Soviet Union and when there were strong trade unions. It is still a good description. So I applaud the, the Department of Economics for resisting which, what must have been dozens of opportunities to revise it in, in one committee and another, and it never happened. So that, that is something you know, worth, I think, celebrating, uh, along with the great change in, in uh, purview. Okay, uh, let me get to the economic sorting, and then, then I will uh, hang it up. Um, the question is, what, what do the students look like? So I'm looking here at demand. And, and I guess the most straightforward to, way to look at at the change in demand in terms of the SES is let's just look at the average income of students. So if the average income of students at these most selective colleges have been going up relative to everybody else, that would be some evidence at least consistent with the idea that these colleges are not making the income distribution situation any more equal. Well, that's exactly what you see. Now, the average income over time has gone up, so I'm correcting for that average in showing these deviation graphs. But uh, just for example, if you want to look between the, the 80, 90, so, so here's the Davis group, and, and they're just about average for uh, college going um, freshmen, and, and we look at the Amherst Harvard group. What's the difference in income between those two groups? In 1970, and this is all in constant dollars, in 1972 the difference was 58,000. In 1990 it was 79,000. And in 2009 it was 85,000. So the income difference between the most selective colleges and Davis or the average is going up. Now, part of that is due to the fact simply incomes are more unequal. But part of it, I think, also is the fact there's some displacement. This national market is, is having some high-income folks in those most selective colleges that weren't there uh, before. You can also look at something like the percentage of students that went to um, uh, private schools. But let me compare to what I found to the Chetty et al. group. So I, I noted this earlier. So these folks are, are great economists and one of the things they've done is use income tax returns and you can find out from their data uh, what the average income of, of the families of the students that go to different colleges are. This shows the percentage of students who come from a family in the top 10%. Note, the similarity between that graph and the one I showed you way back for 1972, it showed just about the same shape. If you want to know where Davis is, let's look. Let's see if I can make that happen. Here we go. Um, now, these, are, uh, yeah, the, the labels on the bottom are designed for you not to read them, but the first one, believe it, is the one that has a circle, that's Davis. And what you see is that about 30% of first-year students come from families whose incomes are in the top 10%. Uh, it's a little bit higher for Berkeley, and then it's a little bit higher for UC Santa Barbara, which is the next bar, lower for UMass, a little bit higher for UNC Chapel Hill, and then the University of Iowa, a little bit lower. If you want private institutions to compare those two, Here's uh, Pitzer and Stanford. Those numbers are much higher. Um, but there was another statistic that has gotten a lot of attention. And, and so Raj Chetty and group have looked at the following. They say, if you want to think about mobility, and, and this is where I'm going to really need to end, if you want to think about mobility, 
Think about what share of your students come from the bottom and how they do afterwards. So one of the statistics they look at is say, let's look at two percentages or, or probabilities. One, what's the chance that a student comes from the bottom fifth? And they base this on the incomes of the parents. So that's, that's one number. The second number is what share of the students that started out in a bottom fifth of a family go to this college and end up uh, in the top one fifth of earnings when they're in their early 30s. That's a conditional probability. Multiply those together and what you get is the percentage of students that come into a college in the bottom fifth who are then ending up in the top fifth. They are quick to say there's nothing causal about this. This is just what is observed. But I show you for comparison these uh, these numbers for Davis, Berkeley, Santa Barbara, and the rest. So for Davis, what we see is that, and it's all is about 19, uh, 2015, about 8.6 percent of students come from the bottom one-fifth of, of households. Of the students that come from the bottom one-fifth, over half of them end up in the top one-fifth. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of students based on a small group, you multiply them together, 4.4% is, is this index of upward to uh, bottom to top mobility. Compare that to Berkeley. It's a little bit lower than Berkeley, but it's a bunch higher than some other places, and these are very comparable institutions. Um, and, and so what you see here, and, and I guess this is maybe near the end, uh, maybe I'll have you know, one more thing to say, but. But basically, if you want to think about the, the potential that colleges have for mobility, it's there. But what it's going to require is policies that increase the, uh, the numbers at the bottom and maybe things that help that second number to be higher. And so it's, it's uh, what, you know, what we do on, on these uh, various campuses. Um, I guess the, the last thing I would just say is that all, with all these changes that we've seen, one thing that has not changed is that there is a durable hierarchy undergirding this whole college structure, a hierarchy measured in prestige and wealth. This stretches from you know, the scores of um, relatively unselective private and public institutions to a relatively small number of very prestigious institutions. Um, in, a, in assessing these changes, we would do well to keep in mind the potential for good that colleges still have to serve the country, as Thomas Jefferson wrote, by training future leaders who would be called to that charge without regard to wealth, birth, or other accidental condition or circumstance. This will be the continuing challenge for America's market for colleges. Thank you. So now we have about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to uh, anybody want to ask questions uh, to Professor Klopfelter? Talk. Uh, my name is Manahil. I am a graduate student at the School of Education and I also work with Scott at the California Education Lab. And I'm thinking, as I was giving that spiel, I was thinking what's the politically correct way to say this. Um, so the story that you told is very depressing and it seems like there are these systemic inequalities that have been persistent since 1971. So, all the small micro-level interventions, reforms, policies that are, being tried out, try, that are being tried out, are they failing in some ways? And like, unless there is a systematic haul, overhaul of the system, nothing is going to change? Like, how would you put the micro-level experiments or interventions that we do in perspective of, of, of 
the larger landscape. So do you want the optimistic or the pessimistic answer to that? So the, you know, I think the optimistic answer is that, uh, in, that uh, it's no mystery what we think, what, what ought to work. But you know, what ought to work, again, is going to work at, at the margins. And whatever policy is pursued, you can be sure that there will be dozens of forces going the other way because people with uh, privilege don't want to give it up easily. And, uh, and everybody wants to make sure that their own child gets the best shake, as, shake that is possible within the bounds of, um, of the rules. And so it's, uh, it's going to be um, hard to you know, move the needle a lot. But we have moved the needle in, in the past. Um, in maybe the most dramatic uh, policy change in the last century was, uh, well, it would be a close tie between Social Security and the desegregation of schools. Uh, so w at one time, there, you could not, in the state of Virginia or the state of North Carolina or some other states, go to the, the flagship university or the flagship um, uh, land-grant college uh, in the state if you were African-American. Now, that is, uh, you know, that's not the case. So uh, policy can, can make a difference, uh, and I think it's, we see that in the state of, of California, uh, there, there are efforts there, uh, and uh, you know, I think the realization that inequality is not all that great for the country could, uh, could make um, a movement in, uh, toward more, um, it's an openness to um, equal opportunity. And this is not uh, in the nature of a handout. This is a nature of let's make it uh, fair. So that's the optimistic uh, answer. And I'll leave the other one uh, for later. Yes, sir. This is a bit tangential to your specific comments, but could you talk about the thoughts you've had relative to either two-year or four-year so-called free college that several potential presidential candidates have talked about? I probably don't have that much uh, wisdom uh, to offer on that. Um, the, the, the son of a colleague of mine uh, once asked his father, Dad, why can't everything be free? And, and so, you know, in economics, that's what we're, uh, that's our um, sorrowful and uh, doleful responsibility to tell people why things can't be free. And so um, I would say that a free college uh, might be in the category of something that um, in, in, a, in a wonderful world, it, you know, it would it'd be good. But um, the, the question that the economists out there are going to ask is, uh, what are we giving up to, to do that? Um, are we, are we giving up universal uh, health care? No, if, if we're not, then, you know, then it begins uh, to ask the question, where are the resources uh, going to come from? So um, I haven't looked at the question in, in great detail. Uh, I, an alternative to across the board free anything would be um, a, a financial aid policy that was more attuned to financial need. And so that those who were affluent, those who had money, uh, no, it wouldn't be free for them, but it, then, but it would be gradated. So that would be a way you could accomplish presumably the same thing with fewer uh, expenditures in, in the form of, we were talking, uh, windfall gains. I'm just wondering if universities um, aren't just um, uh, running the risk of perpetuating the same social mindset that causes the problem in the first place when what our goal is to get more people in those high dollar jobs so that the, you know, our, our ethos or that, you know, that, that, that's the problem we've run into now is that folks, as you've shown in many different slides of this, that the competition between one another is ramped up. And so I'm wondering when we, like, for instance, when we, uh, um, say that so that we call t 
taking a person from the lower 20 per 20th percentile and getting them to the top 20th percentile, if that's our goal, and if that's the message we send, that that's the, that's the function of, of the university, it's a, it's a message that wasn't unlike when Sias was here a while back in another forum, that he had a, he had a uh, coefficient that gave universities a lot of credit for bumping their students to the highest possible income levels. But there's been plenty of um, research on happiness showing now that, that above a certain level, um, your happiness uh, diminishes and below a certain level, you, you, you don't. So shouldn't we be shooting not necessarily for the 20th percentile, but the sweet spot where we're happier? And isn't that the challenge we have as a society now? There's so much of that I can't disagree with. Uh, it is the, the, the again, the, um, the uninspiring role of economists to, to be the spokespeople for um, materialism, I guess, uh, because that's, you know, that's the way we're measuring, um, certainly, progress in, in the SIA's um, data. And that's, that's, when I said Chetty at all, that certainly included uh, Emmanuel uh, Saez. So, um, yes, happiness ought to be uh, our aim or virtue, perhaps. Uh, and you know we don't we're not as adept at, at measuring those other, those things. And I guess the defense for using money income. I and mean, again, I, I appeal to my brothers and sisters in economics to back me up here. But you know, we, if the labor market is working well, then um, wage income is uh, reflective of how productive the person is in society. And, and we we certainly. Uh, want people to be uh, productive in the sense of doing something of value and we do measure it through the market and so you know that goes down the long line of, of what does uh, uh, GDP measure. Um, there has been work on uh, happiness um, and um, we have the Easterlin uh, paradox and whatnot but we basically in, in at least the cross section um, we think people are happier if they have um, enough uh, money to provide for their basic wants beyond what point is you know it does flatten out and, and even uh, economists would uh, acknowledge that so um, so I would say in in the in the sort of prosaic world of economics uh, it's it's not a bad first approximation but I don't think anybody in the room is going to disagree with the the ultimate point uh, that you're making uh, Anne. So when you, you put up the chart showing that ever-increasing uh, earnings of college graduates versus high school, right? and you made the point that affluent families really sort of switched into high gear and responded to that and started making these investments. So how do you explain the fact that for the publics, state governments did not get that message and see, yeah, this is really a, a major pathway to upward mobility and the returns are there, and yet we saw this retrenchment in the public sector. What failure of uh, our political system or, or otherwise would you, would you point to? Are you an esteemed uh, economist who is going to be an esteemed dean asking me something about the behavior of state governments? Um, well, I, I'll, just, I'll just say that my training did not equip me to answer questions about the politics of it. I mean, I guess on the face of it, you, you say these state governments are, are gripped by um, a Medicaid, they're, you know, they're, they've got prisons they've got to build, and, and they've got citizens and, and politicians that want to cut uh, taxes. And so you know, they look and say, well, there's just not that much left over. So if it's, you know, I'm sure that if you get your average state legislator in, a, in an elevator and yell at them, they'll say, yeah, we, we should have more money on the, on the colleges. But you know, when it push comes to shove, it's, it's not the it's not. But I would also say, this is putting a pitch on something we talked about earlier. Um, of all the things you say about um, big time college athletics, one possibility, and we didn't talk about this at lunch, is that big time college athletics may in a sense um, um, protect the, the great public research universities in a way that they wouldn't be otherwise. Because here's the legislature how could I cut the, the dollars for, for UT and Texas A&M? I mean, I, I love these people. And so 
and the same thing goes for us. You know, a state, a little state like Wisconsin, what's it doing producing all these, these research findings, which then go way out into the world? They're not, you know, they're not benefiting from a lot of those. It might be that the love of the badgers is the reason why they're doing it. So that's just a, a, a possibility, but that's as far as I know about uh, politics. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for this talk and also for ending with that slide showing how much a force for mobility UC Davis is. And we can, we can be proud of that in the UC system. You can. I'm going to really change my role and I'm going to answer Ann's question. <laughs> so actually, and I think this is connected to what you were saying, but I have nothing to say about athletics, um, is it seems to me that um, parents are acting for their family. And as the value of education, higher education, was seen ever more and was more a private good, the state who, you know, California, maybe 12% of our California families are represented at UC. They have to deal with the other 88%, many of whom vote. And so, I, I, I mean, for me, the two things are not in antagonism. I'm going to take the last question. Okay. Let's try to end this on a positive note. So one of the, the statistics I, I noticed was a silver lining was the um, racial and ethnic diversity slide. Uh, in addition, certainly since the advent of Title IX, gender diversity has increased over time. Has anyone looked at the standard deviation in income? So all the the top schools, you know, by public and private, had rising family incomes. Uh, with embedded in that, presumably is very, very rich, along with high aid here at UC Davis, we have high aid. Um, Harvard, I don't remember the number, but if your family makes less than 80,000, say, there's uh, you know, no tuition. So can you tell us about the diversity or the standard deviation in income and how that's changed over time, or do we just not know? So is there just a lot more rich and a lot more poor, or is, that, is everybody getting richer? So in a lot of my classes, when I get a question like this, I say, good question, next question. But he said it was the last one. Uh, so uh, I didn't, you know, I mainly uh, dealt with that, uh, this, uh, you know, the first statistic, the, the mean. I, and uh, given the large numbers, you know, I, I felt, well, the standard deviation was small. Now, you, you're asking really a question about the income distribution. And I did look um, at, by category, the, the share of uh, students in various income classes. And, and, and what I found, and I don't know if this would be responsive at all to this, but that the percentage of students from the very top class, at, in, so let's look at the most selective privates, they got bigger. But so did the share in the, of the, in the, from the very bottom class. So what you saw was there was uh, a reduction or squeezing out of, of the middle. But I don't really know if that answers um, that question. So perhaps we've done a better job at rec uh, recruiting the lowest income. No, uh, at, at the same time, the highest income has also uh, squeezed out. But you know, but there are certainly exceptions, and, and I would say that my own institution hasn't had a great uh, record in this way. And and statistics like uh, Raj Shetty's and uh, and others like this, and, you know, people need a kick in the pants and. And, and, when it, and when it becomes something not to feel proud of, when, 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 when it's out there, that X percentage of your students are, are coming from the bottom 20% or only X percent, which it's, uh, it's pretty uh, small in, in some of these rich private institutions, I think you have uh, grounds to say, well, what's going on there? And you know, we didn't talk also about uh, some of the policies, the, the extent to which these gross uh, things that we've seen, most of them were not perpetrated by colleges, but things very close to them are the standard policies of private colleges, such as uh, legacy uh, preferences. So it, you know, w if it became the case uh, that either uh, it became uh, unpopular to do that stuff or, or the federal government said, you know, we're going to uh, make some uh, aid contingent on how well you, you do this. Now, uh, we economists, though, know that 
every pol um, policy like this is going to have unintended consequences. And, and Caroline and uh, uh, Sarah Turner have, you know, been looking at, at these measures, and, and they're, you know, they're not perfect. So. With that, I want to first thank uh, Charlie for being with us today, and also invite everyone to join us out on the patio for some refreshments, uh, snack, a little sugar to uh, set you on, uh, get you ready for your uh, tomorrow's Friday. So, thank you very much. And thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>